The witness of the Gospels come from John chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. One of the Pharisees, called Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish council, came to Jesus by night. Rabbi, he said, we know that you are a teacher sent by God. No one could perform these signs of yours unless God were with him. Jesus answered, In very truth I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. But how can anyone be born when old? asked Nicodemus. Can one enter a mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, In very truth I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born from water and spirit. Flesh can give birth only to flesh. It is the spirit that gives birth to spirit. You ought not to be astonished when I say, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. How is this possible? asked Nicodemus. You, a teacher of Israel, are ignorant of such things? said Jesus. In very truth I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and yet you all reject our testimony. If you do not believe me when I talk to you about earthly things, how are you to believe if I should talk about things of heaven? No one has gone up into heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up in order that everyone who has faith may in him have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that everyone who has faith in him may not perish but may have eternal life. It was not to judge the world that God sent his son into the world, but that through him the world might be saved. May your word live in us. Amen. I want to begin by talking about something called a paradigm shift. Several decades ago, uh, an author by the name of Thomas Kuhn wrote a groundbreaking paper on the structures of scientific revolutions. And he's the one that came up with this term, paradigm shift. What is it? Well, his observ observation was that there comes a time when the way people view the world completely changes. It undergoes a shift that's so revolutionary that you have one paradigm, one framework, maybe framework is a, is a word that means it's the same as paradigm. You, you think of one framework and realize that a new framework has emerged, a new paradigm. And of course his classic example was Copernicus. Copernicus contended that the world was not flat. Everybody said, yeah, but it is. We look out there, and of course it's only our sight that means that we can't see you know, as far as, yeah, but what about those ships with their big masts when suddenly they go, you know, you watch them on, on, on the waters sort of, and you just see the mast. No, 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 that's not, no, that doesn't, you know. The world is obviously flat, and when I was at university, even in the 1950s and 60s, there was, there was, a, there was a flat earth society that still believed that, uh, uh, that the earth was flat. Well, of course, what Copernicus showed that no, the earth was not only not flat and was a globe, that the earth was not the centre of the universe. That in our universe, the sun's the centre of the universe, and we all go around 
all go around. And of course, for a while, all this extra data was coming in that didn't fit the whole idea of being a flat Earth. Astronomers observed that you know, things happened with the planets that just didn't seem to feel right, you know, as if uh, you know, the Earth was... Uh, they kind of... They may moved around the sun. And of course, there was that great shift. That was a paradigm shift. Perhaps more recently, um, when Einstein came on the scene and talked about um, relativity, uh, that uh, more or less said, you know, what's really real is energy and relationships. But of course, everybody who'd worked out of a Newtonian framework, the Newtonian paradigm, said, no, you know, it's made, the world's made up of things, thingamabobs, you know, and atoms and whatever. Uh, you know, that's what's really real. Uh, and everything's mechanically driven, you know, we can push a button there and something will happen over there. Einstein said, well, it's actually different. We live in a world of relativity. Wow. I think some people are still coming to terms with that paradigm shift. But you know what? This is not just for the scientists alone. The common sense of people is that we do live in a world that's relative. Even though we might want to sort of want to climb back to safe Newtonian ways of doing things. The fact is you can't see the new world until the old one can't explain the new data any longer. This shift from the old framework to the new is a paradigm shift. Now, in many ways, this is similar to John's portrait of Jesus. Jesus said, no one can see the kingdom of God without a rebirth without a spirit birth, or as the text that we use today, I read from, said, being born from above. In other words, you can't see the kingdom of God without a complete change in attitudes, for having a new framework for your values. It requires a new paradigm of reality and the social order. And to make this shift, well, it's always pain painful when something's no longer tenable that you hold dear and true. And churches are well known to sort of take a long while to catch up. I mean, it took a long time for, I think, the, the Vatican to acknowledge that, uh, that uh, Galileo was right. Um, and of course, with these changes, people feel insecure, but also released. Paul requires us to die to self, to the old self, to take on to a new self. We die and rise with Christ. John uses a metaphor more of rebirth to talk about the same thing, about being born again, a spirit birth, where there's a reordering of relationships and to life and to your own self and to the ultimate reality we call God. Now, Jesus with Nicodemus comes straight to the point. Who is Nicodemus? <clears throat> He's a Pharisee. He's a teacher of the law. He's a member of the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin. In the time of the gospel, the Pharisees were the minority party. Uh, the majority were the Sadducees, the ones who collaborated with the Romans, says, no, we, we keep order that way. By the time of John's Gospel, by the way, the Jewish council was all Pharisees because the Sadducees just didn't exist any longer. But anyway, as a Pharisee, he would have had for him a world clearly defined and confined. The Pharisees were obsessed with purity. And ritually pure males, they were the chosen ones who finally counted. And they had a long list of exclusions. Women, you'll be interested to know, would never be pure enough. There's a Jewish prayer that's still in existence today where men pray, or the male leader of the, of the ceremony says, thank God I'm not born a woman. 
Children were not able to be richly pure. If you were sick, if you were lame, if you were deaf or you were blind or a leper, all Gentiles were excluded. And in John's time, all Christians were excluded. But those who were really excluded more than any others, do you know who they were? They were the Samaritans. Interesting, next week we'll get to the Samaritan, a Samaritan woman, and see how in God's economy, uh, Samaritans and women are truly included. So do you see what Nicodemus' blind spot was? It was within his religious and world view that said that only richly pure males were the ones that really counted. His blindness, his blind spot was profound. And so Jesus, again, as I said, comes straight to the point. No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above, without a complete change of attitudes, a whole new framework, requiring embracing new perspectives which include all human beings as the children of God. Now, the phrase the kingdom of God, which is very popular in the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, only used a couple of times in John, but certainly used here. The kingdom of God is a phrase that's code. It's code for the reign of God. The kingdom of God is about a whole new way of ordering human relationships. It's got nothing to do with kingdoms as in territory, and that sense is misleading. That's why some people prefer to talk about it rather as the reign of God. Uh, it's like a holy commonwealth. Or from indigenous people, it's like a kingdom. And in this new order, there is true equality and mutuality. It's totally inclusive of all humans. Equity and justice are its marks. It's egalitarian. Power is not based on dominance or privilege or exploitation of the vulnerable. The necessities of life are shared. A different set of rules apply. And in a sense, it's not of this world. But this way of ordering society and lives and our individual lives is thoroughly in this world. And miraculously has the power to transform this world. By the way, no religion or social system can be exactly equated with it. And sometimes people are a bit shocked to say, the church is not the kingdom of God. The church at its best can be a sign of the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is bigger than any ecclesiastical institution. This was what Nicodemus was unable to see. And to drive the point home even further, Jesus says, God so loved the world. Now that text is the text of John 3.16, except it's uh, in Arabic. Uh, and perhaps would be Arabic is a little closer to the Aramaic that Jesus himself would have spoken. God so loved the world, so much that the one sent to declare this fact is willing to die for it. And this is a criterion by which we're all ultimately accountable or judged. God loves the world. And Nicodemus is caught in his exclusive world. He had one enormous blind spot, despite the evidence that Jesus refers to. He talks about, you don't believe our testimony. What are the implications for us? We may have all been blessed by the knowledge that we are truly beloved of God, that we are all included in the human family, and I hope you do. But are we still able to be caught out as those with blind spots? Well, yes, we can. Personally, it could be for any one of us, we let old demons revisit us. Or we hear voices saying, no, you're not good enough, deeply lodged in the psyche. 
And some people, some women still know you're just a woman. Or personally, it could be you return to having to justify our worth. And we find ourselves getting into a, a very self-defensive mode, seeing criticism everywhere, perhaps even when it's not justified. For me, sometimes it's my wanting to be liked. What is it for you? Sometimes, though, of course, we don't know what our blind spots are, and I'll come back to that. Or we could have blind spots that are linked with a lack of awareness of, of other people in our society. We become judgmental of others, one way or another. Yes, there can be social blind spots, because we are socially constructed, socially and culturally constructed creatures. We can still be those who are in denial, let's say, of our racist past. It took a while for me for the penny to drop about the secret river. It's called the secret river because what had to be kept secret was the massacres that occurred alongside the river. And so it's a subject never to be talked about again. And so Australians down the track is a bit like we didn't know the true story about the encounter between indigenous and white settlers here. But we can't be in denial about those things any longer. Or there are what I would call philosophical and religious blind spots. We may still prefer the predictable Newtonian world. We don't really get it that what counts is relationships. You can pull out all the rules as people from a Newtonian worldview do, all the rules here that says what you must do. Rules are important, but in the, in the end, what really matters is relationships. And while I think all of us here would reject crude literalism when it comes to reading the Bible, we can still struggle to live in a world of symbols, like Nicodemus. Can we see our own blind spots? Well, I don't think we can. John assumes, I think, the Gospel of John, the Gospel writer, assumes that we all construct false selves. We pretend, let's say, that we really are nice. We bolster our ego when we're secure. We hide from the harsh realities of life. We escape in a night and we, we kind of create a kind of a bubble around us. Next week we'll have a case study about this particular phenomenon. But what John does, he pictures Jesus as the one who does what used to be called the hat pin trick, puncturing like a balloon our false selves with the truth, bringing to light the amazing truth that we are loved just as we are. So friends, our true friends are not those who say it's all right, dear, all the time and who support our illusions, but those who have the courage to puncture our illusions with the truth. Ouch! It hurts. But this is the occasion when the wind of the Spirit blows with God's grace so that we are, in fact, reborn to new life. And what's happened in our lives is a personal paradigm shift from one reality or one set of falsehoods or one set of thinking to the other which is life-giving. And that Spirit of God then flows into our lives, flows into our community, and together we are bound to God and we know that we are truly loved God so loved the world and that includes each one of us here and the rest of humanity too.